um, both of you have, you know, experience in, in special operations, um, 10th Special Forces Group, 3rd and 5th Special Forces Group, Syria, uh, spaces that we're currently operating in. Uh, are there any, um, you know, like, what are some to help illuminate these examples, some vignettes or examples of, uh, of what we're doing now or what we've done recently that can help explain uh, this, uh, this concept of expanding competitive space? Absolutely. So um, I just ran through some deterrence and compelence theory. Uh, this gets pretty wonky for those who are not embedded in that uh, world. So uh, this isn't just theoretical stuff. Like you said, there are things we're doing right now that get after these aspects, right? So talk about UCOM and Russia. Our RSOFT cross-functional teams over there are getting after this through Special Operations Command Europe right now. They've been doing it for years. This isn't new. Um, the, the resistance operating concept that just came out, uh, you, can, you can read it on uh, JSAL's website. It, it's been a progress for, for the last, I think, six years. I started in 2014 having these discussions on how do we do this resilience and resistance to, one, not impose a U.S. model on these partners and allies, but to support them in what they're already doing. This is, like I said, historically for the Baltics and Eastern Europe, they do resistance. They've, it's in their DNA. How do we enable that? Their total defense program is what we're trying to enable right now, right? So um, going back to the deterrence piece, we are building resilience in their populations. We're assisting with policies and, and government mechanisms that's making their populations more safe, that are preventing Russia from being able to penetrate and infiltrate uh, through whether it's law enforcement, information, primary information. Um, and we're also literally building a resistance capacity to turn the Baltics into a porcupine a hedgehog, a guerrilla force that will make it extremely painful for Russia if they decide to come across that border, right? Um, you can look at exercises like Trojan Footprint, Flaming Sword, Saber Junction. These are all happening right now. Um, and a lot of them get after the partnership piece, right? So our Lithuanian, Latvian, um, Estonian allies and uh, their indigenous territorial defense forces, their special operations forces, they're already doing this stuff. So how we partner with them, how do we enable them? Our ability to bring in a special operations task force or a special operations joint task force or serve as a joint force special operations component command in a ground war against Russia mm -hmm. in Eastern Europe, right? So these are the things we're exercising right now um, as, as First Special Forces Command kind of builds out their, their core, their standing um, special operations joint task force capability. These are important things, one, to, to exercise so we can do it better ourselves, and two, to signal, hey, we have this capability, and we're bringing it in fast. We may not get the tanks there fast, but we're gonna get there fast with our special operations forces, and we're gonna enable this indigenous resistance to stop you. So 10th Group and the Civil Affairs and SIOPS, um, brothers over there, they're all getting after this right now, and they have been for years. So this is not something new if you start talking to anyone in those formations. Uh, the challenge is, is bringing that general awareness to everyone else. People who have been in third group for a while, uh, when I was back in, it was all Central Asia. We did Afghanistan, we did Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and then the, the abrupt switch back to Africa. So they've been in Africa for, for quite a bit. Um, now as we start talking about this resilience and resistance, how does that apply, right? So Eastern Europe, it's, it's pretty ready-made. A lot of these competition activities, like I said, we are in support. This is a supporting effort from the military. We require State Department approval, partner nation approval, to do the things that we need to do. Authorities, permissions, concurrence from the chief submission, right? We can't do the things unless they say yes. Whereas in Afghanistan or combat zones, military can kind of do much more that we want to do, right? So in the Baltics, they're predisposed to saying, yes, we want all of your resistance and resilience capacity, uh, partnership capacity building. Bring it, give it to us, we want it. You go to Africa, ask an African country, hey, do you guys, uh, do you want a little bit of resistance, uh, a little bit of information warfare coming your way? Uh, a little more hesitant, especially from the State Department side, because a lot of our partners in Africa, they're beneficial they, they get benefits from both China and the United States. So to them, it's not very black and white. So to build these types of capabilities and other AORs present more challenges. In Europe, we have a deterrence initiative. We have money. We have, we have a lot of things, uh, XORs, that are already allow us to do the things that we need to do. In right, right now, PACOM, we don't have that, right? So there's a push right now to get an equivalent PACOM deterrence initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple members of Congress just came out with a War on the Rocks article about it. Uh, to get overhead cover and then the money and the authorities flowing, that'll enable us to do our job a lot better. We're trying, uh, but simply it's just a function of authorities, permissions, and, and then the money that comes along with it mm -hmm. to do these activities. So what are we doing in PACOM right now? Um, we've been there for quite a while doing CVO, uh, and this is what you've seen General Clark, uh, SOCOM commander, talk about recently. Uh, is this concept of these twofers, right? It's not CVO just for CVO purposes, for disrupting and degrading terrorist organizations. That's one objective, but it also gives us access and placement with our partners and allies 
to then build resilience against Chinese coercion, right? Our forward presence serves as both a component of competition against Russia and China and as a way to disrupt and deter high value targets in the CBO realm. So these two furs are key. And that's something we have to approach from that mindset. It's not just VEO. It's not just 20 years of what we've been doing. It's doing those activities, but also there's a dual purpose here. So to get that into our mindset and in our plans and how you use CVO as a way to compete, not as its own separate campaign objective, is critical here. Uh, so the concept of two firsts and even three firsts are things we're trying to get is this bang for buck. Um, because, again, if you read our strategy, we're trying to get to a deployment to dwell ratio where it's one and two, right? There's a problem with the force and, and, and you know, the not so much burnout, but we've been going pretty fast and pretty hard for the last 20 years. We're trying to get to a more predictable uh, resourcing. So how do we make the best out of our four deployments without burning ourselves out? And also do competition and VEO at the same time. Because, by the way, SOCOM says... CVEO is still your primary mission, even though we're shifting to Russia and China. So the three first, sir, if you want to talk some about that, that's another whole concept here. So No, absolutely. I'd like to do that and as it means to do that, talk mainly about some historical examples or vignettes from the recent past in the Middle East. However, before I transition completely to that, I just want to uh, piggyback on a couple of things that Steve has already said with regards to other AORs, first in Africa and then also in, in DOPACOM. So with regards to Africa, one thing that I think we can think about as we look to expand this competition space while we're deployed is preparing for those deployments and thinking ahead of time to anticipate what our opportunities might be. One of the great things about SOF is that we have regional expertise, language skills, and rotations, while not always, uh, but oftentimes in the same general areas, if not the exact areas. And so you build up some cachet of knowledge and expertise, trust, relationships with people across the spectrum, the host nation, our country teams, the local partners that you're dealing with in local governments, the security forces that you're training up, uh, the interagency elements that are helping you perhaps with various uh, intelligence functions, operational preparation of the environment and so on. And so that's key uh, to be ready for what can we capitalize on and leverage the next time we're in the area so that you're not coming up with all of these ideas on the spot. And a lot of that can be when you're back in garrison or uh, you know CONUS and Steve has taken his experience in Third Special Forces Group as a guy working with the Jedbergs and in Fourth Battalion, as well as uh, his other operational experience for deployed in Afghanistan and so forth, and transfer that now in a staff position at, in the USAC G5 to say, how can I help guys do that? And one of the things he did towards that end, uh, prior to a, a recent several month uh, uh, in-country training that he had for his uh, new career field as a strategist, was to start up a cross-functional team that brought in interagency elements from the State Department, both the uh, POLAD, the political liaison officer that we had previously had stationed at the USAC headquarters uh, supporting General Baudet there, as well as elements forward from the State Depor Department at AFRICOM, their POLAD, SOCAF, etc., their POLAD, and third group guys, um, different headquarters staff, even reaching out to this um, SVAC and SVAB to say, hey, what are we doing that's congruent or properly aligned with conventional forces that we can have some synergies here, get the proper players in the room discussing, uh, and now in COVID virtually, about what are the opportunities for a two for a three for as Steve gave that example. So I'd encourage you to use that time in garrison to think about your upcoming rotations and how you can do that. Switching to the Indo-PACOM area, one element there that I know is getting after it on a day-to-day -day basis to facilitate things in theater is a joint um, task force Indo-PACOM as they um, do various things to 
uh, on a similar nature, but for deployed to help folks think about how to get after it and to have a common operating picture and a, uh, both on the Intel side as well as the operational side. And so that's key um, in bringing the interagency partners together, much as we've thought about over the last two decades, fusion cells and so forth, but doing it in a very robust um, and deliberate way and also with law enforcement and so forth so that um, everyone is able to be on the same page. That's very similar to what has been established, I think for a little bit longer period of time um, in the Middle East area, we have uh, Operation Gallant Phoenix or OGP that has been doing similar type things and I'll talk about them a, a little bit more here as I go through the Middle East vignettes, but one example that I think uh, brilliantly illustrates this too and arguably three for is we were deployed there, both elements of the 5th Special Forces Group as well as elements of special mission units uh, from JSOC were forward deployed in Syria, operating there and in, in Iraq under de-ISIS authorities primarily. So primarily from a counter VEO mission set perspective. They were getting after it. We all know the campaign over the last few years after ISIS had captured large portions of uh, northeastern Syria, uh, across eastern Syria, then into Al Anbar and so forth. We're moving down through Mosul, Raqqa, and on the outskirts of Baghdad. Well, over time, we were able to push them back, largely because of the partnerships that we are able to form with the Syrian um, Democratic Forces, the SDF, and uh, because they were such a competent, trustworthy uh, force that was willing to get after it, we were able to bring in other elements of combat power, the advising role, uh, the uh, enabler role, intelligence, uh, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, air power, and so forth, really have a force multiplying effect that RSOF is also known for throughout its history. But in addition to doing that, by our presence at forward operating bases in those areas um, during a key time, we also had two other critical impacts. One was against Russia and one was against Iran. So against Russia, we were able when elements of their proxy forces from the, the Wagner Group, uh, their private military contractors, PMCs, were encroaching on our forces. We used the Russian deconfliction line multiple times and sometimes it was effective in being able to get those forces back outside this, the line uh, that they were supposed to stay beyond and other times it was not so effective and the Russians denied that those forces were in any way uh, linked to, to Russia and so eventually after we had gone through the proper escalation channels and uh, amount of deconfliction we called in airstrikes and or and or artillery and in given cases and killed some 200 Wagner group forces did the right did that cause too much escalation as some feared ahead of time would be the case no in fact in that case our competition against Russia which again would not have happened if we were not there under counter VEO de-ISIS authorities and auspices um, uh, the reflections that we got back from the Russians were that they considered that a cost of doing business. There, there was not any further escalation. And furthermore, at that point, uh, they understood the use of force appropriately and backed off at that point. So it was only our willingness, as demonstrated by actually following through on our uh, force, our presence, and what we said we would do, that then caused benefit to pushing back on their presence and their ability to have sway over those areas. Um, and uh, by them not being able to be there anymore, their 
sway over the Syrian regime was diminished in that regard. Also, uh, on the three-for end of things, our presence there disrupted the Iranian ability and their ground lines of communications across their what we refer to as their northern arc from uh, various parts of Iran, from Tehran through northern Iraq and in, into Syria and down into Lebanon to Lebanese Hezbollah. And so that made it more difficult for uh, them to outfit their proxies with uh, the different equipment and armament that they would need to carry on their mission. Also in the counter Iranian set, by being there we generated strategic options for policy makers when policy makers wanted to take things a step further some six months ago and actually strike um, Soleimani, the leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And so that was done in Iraq, um, a bit of a a proxy battlefield, if you will, between Iran and the U.S. in that category, but we would not have had the same capability to do that um, as quickly for policymakers had we not been there under the DISIS authorities, and not only during the main part of the DISIS campaign, but on the back end of that, which highlights one of the key aspects of our trusted and enduring global partnerships that they're there before conventional forces come in, uh, during and after um, across the board. Absolutely, sir. I think that the the importance of, of the combined joint operations area for Operation Inherent Resolve, as we know as the, the SEJOA for OIR, being Iraq and Syria, um, is is almost this 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 experimentation ground for these theories of great power competition and what that looks like for for the rest of the of the nation and the rest of the DOD at large um, you know the the army special operations and the army um, have been involved in Iraq and Syria and have worked together very well to defeat territorially defeat Isis but then also continue to fight against their ideology and their presence and I think um, for all of those young detachment commanders out there that are in the soft triple C or about to finish the Q course and go out to an ODA uh, and they think about their, their role here, whether it's in, in Indo-PACOM or SOUTHCOM or in CENTCOM, um, CENTCOM for an example where you have fifth group ODAs where under the same company, under one battalion, you have an ODA working with the Syrian Democratic Forces in, in actually fighting ISIS in direct combat, which for all intents and purposes looks a lot like large-scale combat through an indigenous force, an operational detachment from the same company deployed to Antomp Garrison in southern Syria, deterring Russian aggression, mm -hmm. and another ODA from that same battalion across the border, still within the Sojoa in Iraq, working with the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service. And if you look at that, that continuum of operations from deterrence to combat to building partner capacity and fighting a real enemy uh, that's I think that's a good snapshot of what Army special operations all together from the special mission units to our our SFCA psyop and what we bring together and then adding in that with uh, the headquarters of an Army Corps that can bring in the resources the logistics the the fires and then the um, you know, that, that leadership of a core headquarters from the Army, that working with an Army Special Operations Joint Task Force, I think that that's, um, you know, it's important to understand that. Um, we look at, you know, the, the legacies that, that Army Special Operations will have, um, and not just SF, but also with the Rangers in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, looking at the, the Commando Kandaks uh, in Afghanistan, when... When the U.S. does uh, tailor down and, and leave Afghanistan, I, I can see a continued relationship, training partnership, much like the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service after New Dawn in Iraq, happening in Afghanistan with those Kandaks, because they're a partnership that we built, we generated, we've employed, we've trained, and then are capable. So when you look at the, the Iraq model and the, the CTS, 
Um, after Operation New Dawn, when Army objectives have been met and the Army as a writ large left, special operations through 3rd Group, 5th Group, our CRIFs stayed to maintain engagement and partnership with DO, um, Department of State, with the Office of Security Cooperation, with the Iraqi CTS. And we saw when it was time to go back in as a answer to ISIS that was more than just drone strikes and kinetic strike, but actually on the ground, taking back Mosul, Talifar, um, those um, Beji, that we had a force that can go in and do it. And the CTS carried the brunt of that in the beginning. And if we had to start that from scratch, cold start, I think it probably would have taken a lot longer. So our presence there, our continuation of those engagements, I think gave us a leg up. As you said, from a cold start, it's sometimes, you, know, you might not be able to get it started at all.